Well, good Thank evening. Um, Brittany, um, my name is Drina Nemes and I'm the host of the book club this year. And I know Nancy and I know Michelle. Um, I'm not sure if I know Marie, but hello, Marie. And our book discussion tonight is on The Feather Thief, Beauty Obsession and the Natural History Heist of the Century by Kirk Wallace Johnson. One thing about this title is that he says the natural history heist of the century. It occurred in 2009 and here we are, we're only at 2022. So I'm hoping that it is the heist of the century and we will not have any further heists, especially of the, the scope of this one. So would like to say hi and ask each person if they would introduce themselves and uh, where they live if in, people may be from out of town and um, say a little bit about what you think about the book. And um, Nancy, if you'd like to start, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, well, again, thanks for selecting the book. Um, I did recommend it. I had read it a couple of years ago and I thought it was fabulous then and even more fabulous the second time I've read it I you know picked up other things it's just like seeing a movie again um, I happen to be on the board of Western Cuyahoga Audubon and live in Middleburg Heights and worked at a museum for that matter but I didn't yeah. steal anything uh, so <laughs> uh, but you know I and I think Drina you'll be asking about uh, museum security um, and so what I can speak a little bit about what how the security at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History was and is now. That'd be great. Michelle? Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Brocious. Um, I am from Rocky River, Ohio, and um, I just loved this book. It was such an easy and quick read for me just because it was so captivating. Um, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I just also want to say that uh, Marie sent a direct message to me through chat that she will be listening and not talking. Okay. Um, she's in a she's in a room with others working. So Marie, I want to invite you if you want to say something, um, feel free to use the chat. I'll keep my eye on it for you. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Hmm. Brittany. Hi, um, I'm Brittany. I um, I actually live in Akron, um, but I went to. I think a couple of events when I was staying in Cleveland, um, my family's in Cleveland. And um, I think I'm on the email list, which is how I found out about this event. <laughs> and yeah, I think that book was really interesting. It's not, um, it's not the sort of book I would normally read. I don't normally read like true crime, but I thought that the history stuff was really interesting. And yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting and in learning about the birds and this like weird world of fly tying. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Do you want to say anything? Okay. Um, I'm Drina Nemes and I'm in Bay Village. And uh, I read this, it was um, excerpted in the New Yorker several years ago. It wasn't the whole book. And I'm not sure, I'm not remembering what the excerpts contained, but it didn't have the chapter on um, Alfred Russell Wallace for sure. Um, but so the second time reading this, I was kind of astounded, especially with that part of the book, the history part. And I really enjoyed that immensely. Um, I found Michelle said captivating. I did too. I was found it was quite suspenseful. And when he was about to interview Edwin Rist, I was kind of on the edge of my chair and a little bit afraid for him as he was. And also when he interviewed Long in Norway, that to me was uh, a very engaging uh, moment. Well, I'd like us just to look at the, the uh, book jacket and 
I'm wondering if you had in your copy of your book, if you had this book jacket with the feathers on it. Okay, so um, I was reading one of the transcripts of Kirk Wallace Johnson, the author of one of his question and answers about the book. And um, he talked a little bit about the feathers of this uh, that are on the front page and the bird, but not until like three o'clock this afternoon did I notice on the cover of this book really how clever the graphics are with the some of the letters just very subtly uh, under the feathers. And boy, I, I didn't notice that until just now this afternoon and also how beautiful the feathers are. And then also I paid a little bit more attention to the um, like label with beauty, obsession and natural history. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but here's the bird. And it is the blue headed parrot. And you can see there's a, a bit of red uh, on the undertail and the red shows through a lot more on the cover on the cover of the book jacket. But um, this is a parrot that lives in South America and it seems to be pretty um, established and it covers uh, a good part of the Northern, let's say almost one half of South America. It doesn't seem to be endangered. But such a beautiful, the such a beautiful bird, and the feathers on the cover really show off something that is just wonderful. Well, then I I was wondering if maybe the book cover jacket designer thought, you know, have like a label, like what a naturalist might have used. And I'm not sure if on the cover if that's actually a label, but I found a uh, a graphic of one of um, Alfred Ru Russell Wallace's labels that he used, and they look similar. So I thought it was a very clever book jacket. So um, as Brittany mentioned, uh, true crime, uh, definitely it's nonfiction. And I heard someone refer to it as ornithological true crime. And this may be another genre. And we talked a little bit, each of us talked a little bit about the book. And one thing though is about like, what is this book about? And I just would like to ask you, open it up to discussion. What are some of the subjects that you found this book was about? Cause it wasn't just really one story. Uh, I th I'm going to start. This is Nancy. Um, one of the themes was just the exploitation of birds throughout history, you know, for the millinery trade. And then, of course, the uh, collection in museums. Uh, of course, that's not an exploitation, but that is, you know, the collections. And then the I didn't realize fly tying was so <clears throat> was so popular and required or but the real true diehard fly tires uh, wanting certain feathers, you know, chicken feathers, nah, nah, not good enough, turkey feathers, nah, not good enough. So, so that was one theme that went through it, but there were several others. Yeah. Brittany? Yeah, um, I thought that was interesting too. Um, it was, yeah, I start, so I started reading it. He starts with the history of the like naturalists and their collections. And I was kind of like shocked at that part. I was like, they're getting, they're killing all these birds just so they can, because nowadays like scientists would not, would largely not ex like experiment in that way. They would try to find a way to observe them without like, you know, interrupting. And I was like, this is so colonialist and whatever. And then it gets into the like fashion industry part. And I was even more horrified. 
And then I started to come around to, well, it's nice that we have these specimens now in museums. And then this guy stole the specimens. So it was just an emotional roller coaster, honestly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. like just all the, yeah, all the connections. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. And I just thought it was really sad that like they've never found the birds. Mm -hmm. You know, probably they're all like disassembled and feathers. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad. And like when um, they, he was talking about like, you know why it's important to have these kinds of specimens because I think a lot of people do think like well why do you need them why do you need so many he's talking about how they used like old seagull specimens to like reconstruct like to prove that like the mercury levels are have been increasing in the oceans over time and I thought that was really interesting um yeah <laughs> Michelle all right, first, I want to share that Marie did introduce herself on the chat. Uh, oh, she thank says you. Her, her name is Marie Fence from San Francisco, California. So oh, that's, great. that's great. Yes. And she says, I have not finished the book. It breaks my heart to know the end. So I stop each time. Um, and I totally can understand that. I just like um, Brittany was just saying, it's a roller coaster of a book for sure. Um, I definitely felt that. I also thought it was just really interesting to learn how these birds were collected, what exploration was scientifically, you know, way back when, you know, that they would kill these birds and bring, you know, and, and ship them back <laughs> um, to the museums. Um, that's just like, like Brittany said, you don't really think about how we got all of these specimens that we have now. Um, yeah, I really don't, don't know if I have anything new to, to add, but I do <laughs> echo what Nancy and Brittany said. Uh, and, and also like, I knew nothing about, I didn't even know fly tying was a thing before this book. Like I knew about tie, like I knew about, about fishing and, but I didn't know that people just did that as a, a hobby, like, like an art form. Um, and hopefully they, most of them, all of them will really start to see the value in um, fake feathers or, or feathers from birds that aren't, you know, protected. Mm -hmm. um, I was so amazed at uh, the journeys that Alfred Russell Wallace and his peers were doing to collect specimens and the conditions that they endured. And uh, especially Alfred Russell Wallace's determination and his long days and being subject to disease and uh, tropical living um, and the amount of time, I think he was eight years um, that he was away in, uh, in the um, Southeast Asia area. Then also um, it was, I found it interesting to learn about the major characters of the book, like Edwin and his early, early life. And then so um, let's say obsessed with fly tying. And then he's this fabulous musician. Um, it seemed to me as I was reading it, like he was so very skilled uh, and perhaps just so talented, but also I was wondering with his obsession with fly tying, did he have a touch of some, you know, some type of perhaps obsessiveness, maybe uh, an, an autism on the autism spectrum. And I wasn't surprised when there was some um, suggestion that perhaps he had Asperger's and then to find out <laughs> later that really he did not. And um, or and he was in a way taking advantage of that. Um, I also think the book is a little, to some extent, about Kirk Wallace Johnson and what was going on in his life and his the way he came into this, how he came into the story, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But also about what was going on in his life. And then how this really took over his life in a way and took him 
all around the world, looking at his the bibliography that he has, he he really read and studied a lot, talked to a lot of people, and um, also then uh, Dr. Prume. Um, he is kind of an interesting character too, and I was able to listen to. Uh, I have it later on in the show a link to a, a webinar um, that was offered at Yale for their humanities and biology department, and it featured Kirk Wallace Johnson and Dr. Prune. And so you can hear him talk and uh, how he was to some extent also very, he was so angry about the situation, also kind of obsessed. And he was the one who copied all of um, Edwin Riss um, face page, Facebook pages and was okay. able to then give that to Kirk Walls Johnson who could do a lot more detective work. So, so many topics about this that are in this book. <laughs> Whoa. And then also too, to me, how life is determined by certain things that happen. So what is the role of fate in this book where Kirk Wells Johnson goes to New Mexico to go fly fishing because he's trying to relax and escape. And he meets this particular guide who is a fly tire and tells him about Edwin Brist. And so I, I would like to read from the book where what happens at, at this time. I don't know if it was, this is page nine. I don't know if it was Edwin's Victorian sounding name, the sheer witness, weirdness of the story, or the fact that I was in desperate need of a new direction in life, but I became obsessed with the crime within moments. For the rest of the afternoon, as Spencer did his best to get fish on my line, I was unable to focus on anything except learning about what happened that night in Tring. But the more I found out, the greater the mystery grew, and with it, my own compulsion to solve it. Little did I know, my pursuit of justice would mean journeying deep into the feather underground, a world of fanatical fly tires and plume peddlers, cokeheads and big game hunters, ex-detectives and shady dentists. From the lies and threats, rumors and half-truths, revelations and frustrations, I came to understand something about the devilish relationship between man and nature and his unrelating desire to lay claim to its beauty, whatever the cost. It would become, it would be five consuming years before I finally discovered what happened to the lost birds of train. And on this slide too, I have one of the, um, it's called a Jock Scott fly uh, and Spencer. Um, this was one of the ties that was in Spencer's tackle box when uh, Kirk Walls Johnson saw it and became so interested in salmon flies because he was only familiar with uh, regular flies. So here are some of the um, major kind of events and things and people um, that stuck out to me about the, about the book. Uh, the bird is uh, one of the Katinga family and I'm forgetting it right now exactly which one it is. I'm, I apologize. Then we have a picture of uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and Edwin Riss below with his flute. It's not a gold flute, but it's, a, it's his flute. And then that beautiful Tring Museum of uh, uh, feathers in a hat. And then the uh, author, Kirk Wallace Johnson. Um, I came across this sales page um, related to feather fever and um, 
This is uh, from a book written by a man named Hornaday in 1913. And he, he was appalled at what was happening with, um, with birds and women's fashions. Um, and he wrote a book called Our Vanishing Wildlife, Its Extermination and Preservation. And this is a, a sales page from a few companies in London. And he uh, gives the total of this, of these two, February and May, these auctions, a total of 223,490 birds were sold at auction, 129,000 egrets. That was the most, seemed to be the most favorite bird. 1,400 herons, this made me sick, 20,698 birds of paradise, 41,000 hummingbirds, 9,464 eagles, 9,472 other birds. Do you know, um... I was wondering if they like the egrets because the feathers are white and they could dye them. Did you come across anything about like why they preferred certain feathers? I understand that the egret plumes were preferred, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know exactly why. There was yeah. mention too that some hats would have like complete birds on them. Yeah, yeah, I know it's crazy. <laughs> And he mentioned, he talks too about how bird dunce like the Everglades used to be before this happened. And now it's now it's like so exciting if you see like a couple <laughs> birds. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, here is a, a picture from the Smithsonian Museum. And um, the screen's cut off a little bit, but they have um, 625,000 bird related specimens, including skeletons, birds and eggs. And um, it's when I saw this picture, it was just kind of stunning, you know, to see this. And Nancy, would you like to say something about museums here? What I can mention in this photo, the curator that's kind of standing in the front, she's no longer there. I can't remember what her name is right off the top of my head. But these collections um, are important, you know, historically. But I know the when, unfortunately, when planes, um, you know, suck in birds in their engines, and they have to figure out what bird was, you know, caused it, yeah, gulls or hawks or whatever, sometimes if they find feathers that are remaining from the plane crash, you hate to say that, then they take it to the museum and try to figure out what bird and how they could keep gulls or hawks or pigeons or whatever uh, away from airports. So, I mean, it's just little things like that. You're like, oh yeah, I never thought about how a museum collection could be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but the, the, the staff of a museum, it, they generally do research. Of course, they have to carefully make sure that uh, all the specimens are, are cared for, uh, especially to keep insects from infesting them, uh, chewing up the skins, the feathers, that type of thing. Um, so, and I know the Cleveland Museum of Natural History doesn't have quite that many, but they have a nice, quite a nice collection. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the birds at the Cleveland Museum are coming now from the birds that strike the buildings downtown Cleveland um, during spring and fall migration. Um, mm -hmm. So um, they're in the process of preparing them. Some of them are study skins like you see laying in the trays. Some of them are skeletons. And some of them are, are simply the wings of a particular species, which provide a lot of information too. Mm -hmm. So. How was the secure? How was how is the security at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History? It's way it's way more strict now. When I first started, you know, it was I, I was there at the museum thirty over thirty years, 
it was a little bit more lax. Um, a lot of more people had access to the collections. Um, at the time when I started, they did not have a curator of ornithology. It was the vertebrate curator. Um, and um, so I did have access along with the registrar who is, was you know, responsible for keeping track of specimens that may have gone out or in. Once they got a curator of ornithology, um, no way could people go into the collections and do what they're doing or what Edwin did was go into the collections, open the cabinets and pull out the drawers. The curator had to pull out the drawers for the person and put them on a table for them to photograph or look at or whatever. Uh, uh -huh. And, and now, now you need a key card to get into the collections. You have to have a, um, an appointment with the curator. So yeah, it's locked down. And this may have been one of the reasons why um, mm -hmm. is the, that, you know, things do get taken from museums. It's not just birds, it's, you know, gems, it's uh, botanical specimens, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sure other things have been taken from other places. Mm -hmm. oh. I was visiting the Cleveland Museum of Natural History once um, a few years ago with my children, and um, they have a wonderful, like, gems and, and, and rock uh, room there, and as my children and I were approaching, we heard that the alarm, there's an alarm that was going off and the gates were down <laughs> for that room. And I, it's a uh, museum staff was standing there and they, they said it was, it was a mistake. Um, and they were trying to get it fixed, but it was just, I don't know. I mean, we couldn't go in. We, we weren't, weren't too sad about not being able to see that room, but it was just, um, now having read this book, I mean, that's amazing security to have, you know, to, to secure your, your items like that in a museum. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, just like uh, people's homes and businesses and stuff, there's cameras all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, and things of course are watched by the security staff behind the scenes. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, and you know, you couldn't even put it past some of the staff that might want to take something or, you know, a cleaning yeah. person, you know, there's just, you know, people are, people are people. People are people. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a security camera in the book, but the guard just wasn't watching it. Was that yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. It's just hard to imagine museums, especially museums that aren't housing like really valuable art or something like having the resources to really stop a determined thief. Mm -hmm. If someone really wants to get in and they're smart and they take the time to plan, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, a number of art museums have had pieces taken, you know. Um, yes. They, and, they, and they cut them out of the frame. So it's like, yeah. ugh, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. It just makes me think how, like I thought the saddest thing about it was how so much blood, sweat, and tears went into collecting those specimens. And they were so important to so many people and for, for generations to come, right? That like, we have this record of like, you know, birds that are like going extinct and like a time period that obviously is in the past. And then one person can just come in and like ruin that. I thought that was like so sad. <laughs> and just like thinking about just how that happens, like with all kinds of things, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's like everyone, it's like 99% of people can be like cool and on the same page and whatever. And then it just takes like one person who doesn't care. And it's irreplaceable. Like you yeah. can't ever get that back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Kirk Wallace Johnson uh, has become over these years since the book was printed, he has become in, in some demand to help museums with security. So it's become a little bit of a, a sideline for him. Um, he talked about it in one of these um, videos that he does. And there are quite a few on YouTube. If you um, put in as a search term, uh, the feather thief, there are quite a few very good things. Um, one of the roles that Kirk Wallace Johnson and also Dr. Prune play is as detectives, 
and trying to find information. There are also some other people in the book that are mentioned in the book too that are detectives and help with assisting with the crime. And then um, over on the on the slide here too, there is the, um, we learn a little bit about the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And Dr. Prum was uh, like just livid that the legalities of sites, uh, you know, just cannot be really sustained in the internet world with people trading things. Uh, there's so much illegal trading going on and it, it infuriated him. So, um, but both of them were uh, really quite persistent and devoted a lot of time to working on this, on this crime and discovering it, especially uh, Kirk Wallace Johnson. And then the sentence that Edwin Riss got um, with the clinician who diagnosed him with Asperger's it completely, you know, it changed the sentence. And so by precedent, um, a previous, previous cases of people with Asperger's changed the dynamics of the sentence. So he ended up with really no prison time. And then the, the birds that he stole, the 299 birds, and um, I think 102 were still had their tags on them, so they were retrieved. 72, I think, were still outstanding. He had cut the tags off of several others, 100 or so, but the birds were valued at 250,300 pounds. And um, Kirk Walls Johnson, or someone makes the comment that they were way undervalued. So, um, Edwin Riss Fine was one half of that, 125,150 pounds. And I couldn't quite tell from the book if, if, what, if it was expected that he would pay that 125,000 pounds because he was, didn't have that much money himself and they gave him a six month time frame. But I, I really, I'm not sure if I missed it in the book, how much he actually had to pay. And uh, then I was just thinking, boy, he did get out of jail free <laughs> and um, not exactly free, but he got out of jail. And um, part of the book does discuss that. Uh, is, was this the, um, did he get payment? Did he get the right punishment? Was there justice or did he really get away with something? What do you think? I think I agree that they didn't actually say whether he paid the fine, but I think it's implied that he must have, because if he didn't, there'd be repercussions of some kind, right? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bummer for sure. I don't know. I mean, it seems like Kirk Wallace Johnson definitely thinks that the Asperger's diagnosis is totally fake, but I feel a little uncomfortable just saying like coming down on that hundred percent. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still, I don't know. There was a comment like that the judge made, I think about how, like, this is, this crime isn't even that big of a deal or something. So like, yeah. you know, which is like annoying. That's not really your job as a judge, is it? To decide like, what's a big deal? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah, about um, whether or not he had Asperger's, it, it, it totally seems like he doesn't, but then I had to remind myself this whole story was written from the perspective of someone who doesn't believe that. So right. it, it is really hard to say, um, you know, whether or not he did. Now, there are comments from those in the fly time community who knew him who think that was um, BS, but, you know, they're not experts either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Asperger's, you know, has a, a like a whole range of mm -hmm. things that can happen to people. I think one of the saddest things is how he used Long. I yeah. think Long, wow. the, at the very end, I think Long was, I mean, he had really nothing to do. He just happened to be the, the, the person who 
you know, why did he use his own, uh, what was it, his own website or his own um, PayPal account? You know, so all this stuff like, really, you know, I just felt bad that I, I think Edwin used people. You know, mm -hmm. he, 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 was, he was a brilliant young man. I mean, he was in college, uh, at, you know, the age of what, 16. He was, you know, the, the, the musician. Um, he, he was especially bright, but um, uh, I, think, I think he used people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely sad. I agree. I agree too it, that uh, Long, he seemed to uh, suffer from what has happened and feels very badly about it. Yeah, I don't think Long had uh, a hand in that at all. And I do not know how Edwin got 299 birds out of a building, right. out of a window in a uh, one suitcase. I know. Right. This is why I don't like true crime because they never actually solve the crime. And I'm like left like, what happened? <laughs> well, they tried, you know. Didn't they say they they balled up? Didn't didn't Kirk Russell Wallace say or Wallace um, uh, Johnson say that they balled up uh, socks and yeah. tried to figure out the size of the birds? But two hundred ninety nine. That and there's some of those are pretty good sized birds too. They had to wait a bit, but I don't know. I agree. Like, how how would he get that out of the window and drop down to the ground? And how much would it weigh? Right. Yeah, how much would it weigh? They never, they didn't talk about that, did they? They just talked about, like, how would it fit in the suitcase? But a right. better question is, like, could you even hoist it? You know, is mm -hmm. it so heavy that it would be, like, impossible for someone to, like, get it out some little window right yes hmm. were you um were you surprised that kirk wells johnson was able to have an interview with edwin wrist yeah i was i i i didn't think edwin would would agree to it and i kind of wonder why he did but i was surprised yeah, and it went on like a whole day, which is interesting too. <laughs> I think he was trying to wear him down to just, you know, break and maybe say something that he could pick up on. But yeah, you're right. It went on for a whole day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was interesting how he basically antagonized, the author basically antagonized the fly tying community like from the jump. Like he shows up to a convention and he starts asking questions and immediately they're all like, we don't want to talk to you. Yes. And then I think it's interesting that anyone talked to him at all after that, because I feel like he was like pretty quickly, they all didn't want to talk to him. Thought he was like digging in things he shouldn't be digging in, you know, making them look bad or whatever. But then he still got a fair number of interviews. I had a, a sense that uh, Kirk Wallace Johnson was, you know, maybe not that easy to work with, um, re perhaps related to his past, but in his work with the List Project, he was, um, you know, he's, he was so burned out too, but he seemed to, um, people stopped paying attention to him and, and didn't follow through and he was dropped from some, some further work. So, and I, I, fell too with like Long and with other people with Edwin, he was pretty aggressive. Yeah, I know. I've, has he ever heard that you catch more flies with honey? <laughs> like if someone is like trying to hide a crime that they committed, I mean, I guess it's one strategy to just start throwing accusations at them until they like say something stupid. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know, like, so since you've been, like, reading more about him, like, I'm just wondering, like, if he's doing okay, because he had this, like, sort of professional crisis with the refugees, and he felt terrible, yes. so he threw himself into this mystery, and then he didn't end up finding the birds, and he didn't uncover what really happened at the museum, and I guess now he's just doing book tours and helping museums with security. Is he, like, is he's, he under a new project, or? He has another book coming out soon. Okay. And um, 
is we learned that he gets married during the book and he seems to be um you know um involved with his family Mm -hmm. now i did hear on one just one of the videos that i listened to and it was kind of recent he said that there was going to be a movie about it now Mm -hmm. i didn't hear that in any other and so i i googled it trying to find out if you know if there's like anything out yet about a movie about this book um it sure it seems like it could be a a a very good movie or how about a series on netflix (laughs) tom hanks maybe has somebody (laughs) um but um i have a sense from this video that i watched from yale's humanities uh biology and humanities series it's from recently from march he he presented himself very well and seemed to be enjoying what was happening and uh he's kind of witty and um he seemed you know okay and there are so many book clubs that have had this book as their topic there are many book club discussions uh that i found uh online so i i wonder how many copies he sold it it seems to be successful that's good (laughs) well i thought that um one thing that i i just absolutely uh enjoyed so much about the book was the alfred russell wallace chapter i told you about and how he was so excited about these birds too and so i have some slides of these exotic and beautiful birds um, he the fly time community community refers to a certain group of birds as the blue chatterers and uh, i could not find that in ebird at all but they are cotingas and here are some um, species of cotingas and then this red rough fruit crow, which the uh, community, re- fly time community refers to as Indian crow or even IC. These are uh, very lucrative. Um, Edwin took 47 of them from um, the Tring Museum. Uh, these are South American birds. And then here's one of the birds of paradise, the magnificent rifle bird. And uh, he stole 24 of them. And some of them were actually that Alfred Russell Wallace had actually brought back to England. This is uh, the Kingbird of Paradise. And this was seemed to be one that um, Alfred Russell Wallace was especially keen on trying to see. And um, it is a big hit. Uh, for feather trading, fly fly feather trading, and fly tying conventions. Um, This picture does not really show what the bird does during its mating uh, dances, and it has the two long extensions with like medallions at the end that are emerald green, and they fly up behind them, and uh, wings fly out from the sides, and becomes um, much uh, larger than it appears here here too. Some of the pictures, the feet that show are so blue, like almost brilliant blue feet. So, um, and then the superb bird of paradise. Um, have any of you seen some of the National Geographic that show this bird in its dance? If you get a chance to uh, on YouTube, if you Google um, Bird of Paradise, National Geographic or Cornell Lab also has it, but um, you can see the bird up in the left corner, but it, it so changes its shape, it makes a skirt and he dances around. And it, of course it looks like he has eyes there too with those blue. Um, that's his face that he shows the bird. Dancing face, Gary's telling me. Dancing face. It's, it's just amazingly awesome. Um, 
Yeah, I think there's some YouTube videos that you could probably um, take a look at too of some of these birds of paradise and you know watching their dances and um, yes. maybe even go onto the Cornell site because I, I yes they're just amazing really like nothing else and oh also we haven't really talked about but um, so important to this whole story is really Alfred Russell Wallace and his own coming to the theory of uh, natural selection and how important um, his body of knowledge was uh, to really also supplement and, uh, you know, reinforce, reinforce Darwin. Um, I think uh, it was, it turns out that he does, he did get some recognition. He got a fair amount of recognition in the um, scientific community in London during his time. And um, so I'm happy for that because he really seemed to sacrifice a good part of his life. Maybe he didn't sacrifice it to himself. He, he did it, right? Um, and then I was really happy to know that there is a bird of paradise named for him. And um, it's called the standard, standard bird of paradise. And it has something to do with like military um, I think military uh, garb. Um, this is not a very clear picture. It's it's in the midst of its dance, but I was happy to know there's a, a species name for him. Um, some resources if you're interested. This American Life, that great podcast, um, has a, a, a podcast devoted to the feather thief and. Um, Kirk Wallace Johnson is featured in there. He's interviewed. And then um, the I was referring to the Yale Science and Humanities um, Distinguished Speaker Series just from recently from March that features Kirk Wallace Johnson and Dr. Prome. And then also uh, some different YouTube sites, as Nancy mentioned, too, about the birds of paradise. National Geographic has a fabulous, absolutely fabulous series um, by the ornithologist Ed Scholes and the photographer Tim Lehman, they spent 10 years and captured 39, all 39 birds of paradise species. And uh, it's a beautiful, um, beautiful video. It's on uh, uh, Disney Plus National Geographic. So, um, just this is our third and final book club meeting of the year. It has been a fabulous year of reading. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed every single book. They were, it was such, it turned out to be such great choices. So thank you everybody for your input on this. Um, next year we have dates set up and uh, the fourth Tuesday, quarterly, so it'll be October and January and April again. Um, I have, I've been gathering titles. It'll, it's going to be somewhat hard to make a decision, so I'm going to ask for some assistance with that. And I would really like to thank the um, Western Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga Audubon Society for their support for this and to the participants too. It's been really a good year, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you for organizing this. Um, I, I only found out about it for this book and I wish I had read the other books with you guys, but I think this is really cool. And I appreciate your PowerPoint with all the pictures of the birds. So thank you. You're welcome. Just thank you, Drina, for, um, for, for leading these book discussions and, and picking out such amazing books. I've had a, a very fun year of reading as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think next year's books are gonna be just as fun. Well, I, I think there's some good choices that are out there that Drina yes. will, will make those choices. But I just wanna mention, you know, I never really paid attention to the, the subtitle, Beauty, Obsession and the Natural History Heist Obsession. 
there was so much obsession in this book, first mm -hmm. of all, for bird feathers, for the fly tires, and for, for Kirk Walls' Johnson and his obsession to, to figure out, to, to solve this crime. I mean, everybody was obsessed. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think that secondary title is very, it's a great title. It captures so much. Yeah, whose obsession is he referencing? His own? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. Or was it Edwin's? Or was tires. it the fly yeah. tires? Or was it? Yeah. Yeah. This was wonderful, Drina. Thank you so much for you're welcome for pulling putting this together. The wonderful slides and and re and references resources. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I I really enjoyed doing this, and the, the book has been very very important to me. Yeah. Anything else? I think that's it for me. Thank you, Brittany, for joining us. And Marie, thank, thank you very much. I hope you can make it next next season too. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Nancy.